Turing 6502, the notepad. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. I do go over these videos relatively quickly, so don't be afraid to watch them multiple times if you need to. My 80-year-old mother told me that it was only on the fourth viewing that the rule book made sense to her. In the last video, we introduced Alan Turing as the most pivotal figure in the early era of computing, and he's recently been honored by being depicted on the new 50 pound note. He's considered to be the founding father of computer science, and he played an important role in cracking the World War II Enigma code, which was thought to be uncrackable. In his 1936 paper, he formalized what we tend to do naturally in mathematics. In his paper, On Computable Numbers with an Application to the Entscheidungs Problem, he not only solved this problem, but he also defined a Turing machine and a universal Turing machine, which is a machine that can emulate any other Turing machine. And I think a Turing machine can be defined as being a rule book and a notepad. But we also need to point it to our current rule, and we need to keep track of where we are on the notepad. This is where we got up to last video, and you might notice a slight change. I've put the bar over the word right rather than left. This more accurately reflects what I do in hardware. So we have the rules themselves, which is stored in an EEPROM, and then some D-type flip-flops which keep track of the current rule. They also store the right symbol and the left-right signal. But in this video, I want to focus on the notepad itself. And then at the end, I'll do a build of this notepad. But I've got a bit more theory to cover first. In the previous video, we looked at where Turing defined the rulebook. And now we'll look at the notepad. The machine is supplied with a tape running through it and divided into sections, each capable of bearing a symbol. And this tape is the analog of paper. So I want to go back to Monopoly and have a look at the rule book again. Remember that our next position is determined by our current position and the number we roll on the dice. And some might have noticed that this is just a big adding machine, which has some exceptions around jail, and it wraps around at 41. This might become a bit more clear when we replace the street names with numbered states. 1 add 3 is 4. Then 4 add 2 is 6. So this table does a primitive form of addition, and this would be great if I ever needed to add 2 to 38. I'd be in luck. But what about bigger numbers? What if I wanted to add these two numbers together? I have no rule for this in the Monopoly rulebook. Now, we all know how to add these two numbers together. Here in Australia, it's taught in primary school. 7 plus 6 is 13. Write the 3, carry the 1. 1 and 2 is 3. Add 9 is 12. Write 2, carry the 1. 1 and 5 is 6. Add 1 is 7. No carry. 3 and 4 is 7. Write 7. 8 and 9 is 17. Write the 7, carry the 1. 1 and 1 is 2. Add 6 is 8. And we're done. So now I want to build a machine that can add two arbitrarily long numbers, just like humans can. And I'm going to do this by modeling the rule book we have in our brain and the way we write the numbers on the notepad. And when we humans do it, we operate on one column at a time. Then, it's only carry or no carry that goes between the columns. In fact, once we're finished with the column to the right of where we are, we don't need to worry about it again. Similarly, we don't need to worry about the columns on the left that we haven't come up to yet. So we need a rule book that adds two single digit numbers together, but also handles the carry between the columns. And although it feels like we're operating on a column, in reality, we're actually just operating on one square at a time. For the upper number in a column, we may add one if there's carry and keep this new number in our mind. And then we add this new number in our mind to the bottom number. We don't just strictly add the upper number to the lower number in any single column, because that doesn't take into account carry. So when using the notepad this way, I need a way to remember where I am on the notepad. I might do that by holding my pen over it, or I might just keep track of it in my mind. In this column above the highlighted one is a five with carry. Five with carry is six, which is why I'm in state six. In the machine, we have some hardware which remembers this number. Next, I look at all the possible rules that could apply to me while I'm in S6, and then I read the one from the notepad and select the one column in the rule book. This gives me the behavior, which tells me to write a 7 on the notepad, move to the non-carry state, and then finally change my position on the notepad. Don't worry too much about the complexity of the rule book at this stage. I'll come back to that later. 
Let's go back and see how Turing worded this exactly. The possible behavior of the machine at any moment is determined by the M configuration, QN, and the scan symbol, SR. This pair, QN, SR, will be called the configuration. Thus, the configuration determines the possible behavior of the machine. Here, what Turing called QN is S6, or sum of 6, and SR is just the digit 1. Now, we humans like to do long addition this way because it shows all of our workings and it makes it easier to spot a mistake and so forth. But even the 6502 microprocessor can do tens or even hundreds of thousands of additions per second. So there's not enough space in memory to store all these workings even if we wanted to keep them. So this time, I'm going to do the long addition without a results line. I'm just going to overwrite the bottom number and keep the carry in my head. Now it's still the same process and the same rules apply. What's changed is where I write the number and the fact that the bottom number is lost. But nearly all microprocessors do it this way. But Turing put an even tighter restriction on our notepad. Instead of being a two-dimensional sheet of paper, we're only allowed a one-dimensional strip. Even worse, the machine may also change the square being scanned, but only by shifting it one place right or left. This means we can't move about the tape randomly. We're limited to sequential access. So that's a bit of a fly in the ointment. How am I going to convert this two-dimensional problem into a one-dimensional problem? The answer is I intercalate them. That is, I write one number down, and then I squeeze the digits of the other number between them. So now I have a one-dimensional representation of both numbers, where the digits of each number alternate on the tape. Now let's see if I can still do the addition. 7 plus 6 is 13, write 3, carry 1. Carry 1 plus 2 is 3, add 9 is 12. Write 2, carry 1. 1 and 5 is 6, add 1 is 7, no carry. Erase the 1 and write a 7. 3 and 4 is 7, no carry. Cross out the 4 and write a 7. 8 and 9 is 17, write the 7, carry 1. 1 and 1 is 2, add 6 is 8, and we're done. Note that I kept the carry in my head, I didn't write it down anywhere. And finally, the answer is easy to see if I cross out the other original number. In fact, in my rule book, I'll do this as I go along rather than at the end. This is the machine we've defined so far. We somehow need to connect the read symbol on the rule book up to the notepad. But before that, I need to talk about how to read and write from the notepad itself. Reading from and writing to the notepad is controlled by this signal, called write enable bar. When write enable bar is high, we read from the notepad, and when it's low, we write to it. If I connect the clock bar signal up to the write enable bar signal, that means we read when the clock is low and write when the clock is high. I go over clock in a lot more detail in the Apple II wire by wire build series. In the Turing machine, we read a symbol, then we write the symbol from the rule book back over the top of it, before moving to the next position. If we want to leave the value on the notepad unchanged, then we just write back the value we read. To feed the symbol from the notepad back into the rule book, all we need to do is connect up the data bus from the notepad to some of the address pins on the rule book. These are the address pins I used, but it's pretty arbitrary. Now we have this write symbol pathway that I want to connect. I'll put this enabled buffer in the write pathway and connect it to the data bus of the notepad. The write occurs when the clock signal is high and clock bar is the inverse of clock, so the write occurs when clock bar is low. Now here's the sequence of events I want to occur. After the falling edge of clock, we read the symbol from the notepad. Then we use the symbol to look up the rule book. And a short time later, we latch the behavior into the flip-flops on the positive edge of the clock. Then, once the clock's high, we write the new symbol from the rule book into the same location in the notepad. Reads from the notepad occur while the clock is low, and it follows this green pathway. Note that the buffer in the write pathway is disabled. Then, when clock goes high again, the write occurs following this purple pathway. Now there's this one last signal which updates the notepad location. 
As mentioned earlier, in the strictest definition of a Turing machine, we must move exactly one place left or one place right each clock cycle. How do we do that? Well, one of the easiest ways is just to connect it to an up-down counter and feed the output of this up-down counter into the address pins of the notepad. Which gives us this updated timing diagram. After the positive edge of clock, the notepad address is either incremented or decremented, and the values latched in on the negative edge of clock. This means the next read cycle of the notepad has the updated address. Now I need to update my rule book to reflect this new information that's required in the output. First, convert from street names to states, and let's isolate out one configuration just to make things easier. I need to change this dice label to read symbol, and this behavior should be read, go to rule Q6 next. But now I have a write symbol to worry about. So I'm gonna go from go to Q6, to this six, followed by an arrow Q6. And that means write six on the notepad, then go to rule Q6. So when we look at it in the table, it should read, write six to notepad, then go to rule Q6 next. Now I'm gonna to add to it even further, by putting on the direction you want to move on the notepad. So this Q6 becomes 6 arrow Q6 comma L. And this should be read as write 6, then go to Q6 and move left on the notepad. And while we have this complex expression, in reality, it's just a hexadecimal number. And its components can be derived directly from the output of the flip-flops. So when we see it in the rule book, it should read, write 6 to notepad, then go to rule Q6 next, and move left on the notepad. Now let's make the rule book for long addition. And I want to use this unusual form, where I erase the two original numbers as I go along, and write down the result. I need 11 symbols for the rule book, which are just the normal Arabic numerals, and an underscore for blank. And I need 13 rules. Two are for carry and non-carry, which tells me if there's a carry after adding a pair of digits. If there is a carry, then I need to add one to the first digit of the next pair. Otherwise, I add zero. The remaining 11 rules are labeled S0 through S10, and they represent the sum of the carry and the first digit in a pair. S0 means there was no carry and a zero in the first digit, while S10 means there was a carry and the first digit was a nine. That is, nine plus one is 10. And there's another condition called stop, which means we're done. So here's our long addition rule book, and it's a bit overwhelming at first. But note that we have the rules along the side and the symbol across the top. And the rules are broken into two clusters. There's a cluster of S0 through S10, and another cluster of carry and no carry. And what we can see is that we alternate between a carry no carry, then an S0 to S10, then back to carry no carry, then S0 through S10. The start condition is special and we start in no carry. This oscillation between clusters occurs because we're really treating the numbers as pairs, where after the first digit we want to know the partial sum, and after the second digit we just need to know whether to carry or not. Let's break the rule book down to its components. If we're in no carry, it means we've just started, or the sum of the components in the previous column were less than 10. In this case, we just erase what we saw and move to a rule represented by symbol plus zero. So if we're in no carry and we see a five, we just write the blank symbol, which is the underscore, and move to S5. Then move left on the notepad. For carry, we just write back the blank symbol and move to the rule, which is represented by symbol plus one, then move left. So this time when we see the five symbol, we write back a blank and go to S6 and move left on the notepad. Rule S0 is probably the easiest. It means the first digit in the pair was zero and there was no carry. This is the same as when there's a zero in the upper line of the equation with no carry. In this case, we just write down the symbol we saw, move to the no carry state, and as usual, move left over the notepad. If we're in rule S5, it means that we either just saw a four with carry or a five with no carry, because they're the only two ways to get to S5. If we're in rule S5 and we see a four, we write nine with no carry and move left. If we're in rule S5 and we see a five though, we know the answer is 10. So we need to write down the zero, go to the carry state and move left. So hopefully the rule book makes a bit more sense now. The final condition is stop 
and we stop when we see a blank in the bottom row. So here, let me move through our favorite example again. The number above the arrow is the read symbol, and the number below the arrow is the write symbol. We start off with no carry, then we read the seven off the notepad. Next, we look up the rule book and see what to do if we're in rule no carry, and we see the symbol seven. In response, we write back a blank, we move to state seven, and then we move left on the notepad. Next, we're in state seven, we see a six on the notepad, look it up in the rule book. We replace that six with a three and move to the carry state and move left again. In the carry state, we see a two, look that up in the rule book. We replace the two of the notepad with an underscore and move to S3 because two plus carry equals three. And as always, move left. Now in state three, we see a nine, we replace that with two with carry and move left. Carry in five, we replace with the underscore and move to state S6 and move left again. And we repeat this process for all the digits on the tape. I'm not going to show the rule book for the remaining digits. I want you to see if you can predict what the machine will do. And I think I'll stop there, but I'll replay it one more time at high speed. Here's our template for a Turing machine with 256 symbols. When I stick strictly to Turing's definition, I call it pure Turing, although a pure Turing machine would have unlimited memory. And it was about this point in time that my wife said, well, that's a great adding machine, but what about a real computer? Which led to a discussion about the Church Turing Thesis. The Church Turing Thesis, formerly known simply as Church's Thesis, says that any real world computation can be translated into an equivalent computation involving a Turing machine. It should be noted, though, that there has never been a proof but the evidence for its validity comes from the fact that every realistic model of computation, yet discovered, has been shown to be equivalent. So what this means is that our Turing machine template is a real computer. The only limitations it has are memory size and speed. This playlist is about the Turing 6502, where I build a machine based on Turing principles, which can execute 6502 machine instructions in real time. After the build, we're going to focus on how to generate the rulebook. And now I'm going to be doing another playlist called Pure Turing. And this is where I walk through the architectural changes from a Turing machine to a von Neumann machine. This is for the hardest of hardcore enthusiasts. There's a lot more detail in that playlist, but I want to make a point about Pure Turing now. The main change I made for the Pure Turing machine was to limit it to four symbols, which are underscore for blank, 0, 1, and the dollar symbol. This is effectively equivalent to a 1-bit CPU. And here we have one. This was an early prototype built on VeroBoard. Now, to keep track of notepad location, I need this 20-bit binary up-down counter. There are a couple of different ways to build this, but for this build, I use five of these chips, the 74HC193. Each chip only has a 4-bit output, but they can be connected together to form a 20-bit counter. 
I've colour coded part of the schematic diagram, which makes it easier to spot these components on the board itself. Blue is the rule book, red is the notepad, green is the up down counter, white is for storing current state, and orange is the write buffer. Alright, let's see if it works. It works. I'll play it again. Now the observant people might have noticed that this is a bit slow. In fact, I've already sped it up a thousandfold. This whole sequence took about three hours. The reason it's so slow is because of this, the sequential access. The real 6502 can access any byte in its memory range in one clock cycle. But here, the Apple II memory is laid out a bit sequentially on the Turing tape. So to get to a particular location, it has to step over every location before it. It can take a couple of million clocks to access a byte in one of the upper pages. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to break the notepad into two parts. One part is for the 6502 registers, and the other part is for the Apple II main memory. The remaining part of this video is the Turing 6502 notepad build. Here are the chips I use.
And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe and share.